Members, the Lord of Speaker. Honorable members, please be seated. Secretary General. Motion by the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Social Affairs. I now call upon the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Social Affairs, the Honorable Vian Pile, to move his motion. You have the floor, sir. Honorable Speaker, say I move that Parliament debates the report of the annual review of the Etoki Trust Fund Board 2017, which was tabled on 1st April 2019. Thank you, Honourable Thank you. Is there a seconder? Honourable Speaker, sir, I second the motion. I now invite the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Social Affairs to speak on the motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Say. Honorable Speaker, say, the Ethiopia Trust Fund Board was established by the Fiji government to foster investment of the indigenous Fijians and Rotumas by promoting initiatives that will better their standard of living and enhance appropriate <coughs> cultural traditions and values. The objectives of the board are to provide funding for the undertaking, promotion, and sponsoring programs on Ethiopian culture, language, and the study of ethno-history and ethno-geography. To provide funding to help develop the management, leadership, and entrepreneurial skills of the indigenous Ethiopian and Rotumans. To sponsor research into languages, art and culture of the Ethiopian and Rotumans and the better understanding and the preservation of their heritage. And to, to undertake any other purpose approved by the board to be beneficial to the Ethiopian and Rotumans. As of 31st December 2017, the board had a full complement of eight members. This enabled the formation of three subcommittees to scrutinize papers before final consideration by the board. Through this Standards were established to ensure transparency, access to independent professional advice, and code of conduct. The three subcommittees include the following investment and finance, culture and heritage, governance, and human resources. Furthermore, the major achievements of the board in 2017 were the Fijian dictionary projects, including the e Bolabosa app. The app was completed, and the Android vision was launched on 19 December 2017. The curriculum on traditional leadership and governance titled Sau Vaki Ni Vanua was approved and registered by the Fiji Higher Education Commission as a certificate three-level course. In co collaboration with the Ethiopian Institute of Language and Culture, two new comics of Fijian folk tales, Dere Vulakata and Dimailangi, were illustrated as comic print productions. To conclude, the Ethiopia Trust Fund Board managed to fulfill its legislative objectives in 2017. We commend the board for the positive impact made on the indigenous communities through the language, culture, and heritage programs. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honorable Chair. Honourable members, the floor is now open for debate on the motion. Honourable Rochale, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir. 
I thank the Standing Committee on Social Affairs on this uh, report. The reports by the Standing Committee of Parliament are very important, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, because they are indicators of performance of organizations and departments. And I think it's important that the report should capture the uh, performance of those organization departments as far as the delivery of key result areas, the monitoring mechanism in place to see that the plan of government uh, captured in the national development plan are featured and, hit, and uh, achieved. For Parliament, it's important also that we be able to review the resources that we are providing these departments and organizations, whether they've been put to good use or not. And I feel that these reports should have also captured this. There are nine areas in the report that this committee reported on. I'm not going to talk about all of that, all of those. It talks about the administration, the policies, and uh, the challenges and highlights that uh, this board has gone through during this period of report. This is a report on a board, Mr. Chair, and I feel that the report should have captured the governance, governance aspect of this trust fund board. It's a board. I would have expected this report to have covered the things like the board members and how they are performing. Who are they? Are they uh, the right people to be in the board? Because it's very important for accountability and transparency that we have the right people in place to manage affairs of government and also the uh, use of the government resources. There were recommendations that were included in the report, Honorable Speaker, sir. Page seven of the report says that there is a shortage of specialized skills in language and heritage areas. The question is, how long has this been in place? How, how long has this problem been in place? What is the recommendation by the committee to be able to, to address the shortfall and this need? The report didn't capture anything of that nature. But I feel for the reports of committees, when we identify areas to be improved, there need to be some recommendation on what to be done. And that will be very helpful too, Honorable Speaker, sir, to this department, in particularly those organizations and departments. I know that I was in government before. The reports of this committee are scrutinized by departments very carefully so that we can learn from and do what are necessary to be done. On page seven also, Honorable Speaker, sir, it says the challenges the board faces in terms of investment opportunities are Citing the need to review the Itoke Trans Trust Fund Act 2004 to confirm with the Trustees Act 1948. The problem, as they saw, as I highlighted in the report, is cannot make an uh, investment in any company that has not provided any dividends in the last five years, and also the board is not able to invest in companies that have negative social impacts and families on families and society. Again, Mr. Speaker, sir, I would expect 
committees to have come up with some sort of solution in this report. My remarks, Honorable Speaker, sir, should be seen as something to improve how we address our role as committees of this department, of this parliament, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That is my contribution. I thank the Honorable Member, and I give the floor to the Honorable Andrew Chair, Johnny Baravi. You have the floor now. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Speaker, Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Leader of Opposition, Members of Cabinet, and Honorable Members of the House. I would like to contribute to the uh, debate this morning on the Tokyo Trust Fund Annual Report for 2017. First, I'd like to thank the uh, chairperson of the committee and members of the committee for the report before the House. The Trust Fund, Mr. Speaker, sir, the Fijians Trust Fund, was a creation of the Mbosele Wagduranga at its meeting in 2001. It first started as a trust with the uh, objective of ensuring the autonomy of the Mbosele Wagduranga or the Great Council of Chiefs. And it also ensures the promotion and protection of indigenous culture and heritage, Mr. Speaker, sir. I note that this was changed in 2017 when it was administered under an act of parliament. The committee has noted on page six of their report that the core business of the fund is to enhance, enrich and promote the quality of life, culture, leadership, entrepreneurial knowledge and skills of the Toke and the Tumans. It has moved away from the initial focus of the establishment of the trust fund. It was supposed to look very closely into how indigenous Fijians, or the first people of the nation, can protect and promote the tradition and culture. I note the various activities that have been carried out by those that are managing the Fijians Trust Fund now. The Bosele Vukturanga, in ensuring that the fund, that the trust fund has uh, investment funds to enable it to carry out the initial objective of the trust had provided that 10, 10 million uh, shares in Fijian's trust fund and that allowed the Fijian's trust fund its initial seed capital to finance the objectives of the trust fund. The 20 million shares in Fijian Holdings that was funded by government was divided between the trust fund for 10 million and the remaining 14 provincial councils shared the 10 million shares in Fijian Holdings. It was the 10 million shares in Fijian Holdings that was transferred to the Fijian Trust Fund that created the initial seed capital to allow the Fijian Trust Fund to carry out or to implement programs to ensure the attainment of the first objectives of the trust fund. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, sir, I uh, note the programs that have been uh, implemented by the trust. Whilst I commend the fact that the trust fund has not um, been removed by um, the military government at that time. It is continuing uh, to be in existence and it's contributing on the per preservation of the culture of the First Nations or the first people of this nation in some small way, contributing to Fiji's obligations of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That declaration is the affirmation of the fundamental human rights of the indigenous people of Fiji to manage their own resources and institutions. To me, I view it as a form of a lip service to the need for our people to continue to appreciate our culture, our tradition, and the apex of the Fijian administration of the Fijian people in the Bosilebo of Unfortunately, 
the building that was uh, paid for by the Fijian Trust Fund is no longer the hallmark of our country. A lot of work, intricate work, was carried out to ensure that the Mbosele Vokturang complex in Raimba came out the way it was, utilizing fine tradition and culture, handicraft, choices of timber to ensure that the tradition culture is represented in the valley in Mbosele Vokturang. We understand that expression of interest has been put out in the reconstruction of that complex. Mr. Speaker said so whether it will become, it will be preserved again for the great council of chiefs, we do not know. We do not know whether some consultations have been carried out with the Fijian people on their views into the type of structure, the reform of the new Valin Bosrevukturama will look like. It is unfortunate that this has not happened. I note the continuing good performance of the Fijian Trust Fund, and I'd like to congratulate the Chief Executive Officer and the members of his of the trust fund, the employees. I note, sir, that a lot of emphasis has been put on the continuing education, improving the education qualifications of those that are working in the trust fund. Whilst I appreciate that, I'd like to ask this honorable house that the Fijians trust fund should do more, should do more work to ensure that the indigenous people the first people of this nation continue to value, appreciate, and promote matters about our tradition and culture. When I spoke on this same subject, I think in 2018, I had pleaded with the House that the Honorable Minister for Fijian Affairs, the Honorable Prime Minister, consider establishing or perhaps we can begin with the Nandavi development um, uh, a center in Taro, Niambao. We should consider establishing tertiary studies to be undertaken by our people so that our people understand who we are. Why do we have Matangalis? Why do we have Yavusa? Their roles, their responsibilities. That can be better done if our people go through some form of tertiary education that will allow them better understanding, sir, of the Fijian way of life. We are a distinct people, the first people of this nation. We need to continue to protect our identity. We understand that we are living in Fiji. We value multiracialism, Honorable Speaker. But First of all, we need to ensure that our culture, our tradition is protected, is understood by our young people, so that we continue to have our separate identity, Mr. Speaker, sir. I note, sir, that uh, there are some forms of training being carried out, volini saunivan nua, etc. While that is good, sir, the root of the problem needs to be addressed. And the problem is that we need to do more for our people, for our younger Fijian, the first people of the nation, sir. We need to ensure that they understand and they value it. That can only be done if we have a tertiary institution to ensure that they come out with certificates, diploma, degrees, even PhD. I'm, I'm saying this, Mr. Speaker, sir, because in New Zealand, the Maoris are doing it. They have established the Wananga, where Maoris learn about themselves, the intellectual capacity. It needs to be captured. It needs to be appreciated. And it can only be done if we have an institution that teaches all this to our young people. I'd like to suggest that 
the ministry considers Nandavi, the development center in Taro, Niambao, to start off the training sessions for our young people who want to know more, who want to value, who want to understand, and who will want to continue to promote their identity, Mr. Speaker, sir. Therefore, I um, endorse the comments that have been made by my uh, honorable colleague this morning. The need to do more. We are told that there are eight board members. We are not told the qualifications of the board members. Are they equipped? Do they have the passion oh, to enable the program of the Fijians Trust Fund to realize the initial objectives that, is, that were set out by the Bosse Turam. I am pleading with the Honorable Prime Minister, Kim Lee, Minister for Fijian Affairs. We need to review. We need to review. We need to review the program of action with the Fijian Trust Fund. And I'd like to ask that we acknowledge the decision of the Mbosa Turang in 2001 to establish the trust fund with those noble objectives. We cannot just put it aside. Mbosa Turang is going to remain as an institute that is revered and respected by the first people of this nation. There's more to be said, Mr. Speaker, sir, but I'll end there. I think uh, some of my colleagues would, uh, would like to contribute to this motion. And I thank you for the opportunity, sir. I, I thank the Honourable Member for her contribution to the debate. I now give the floor to the Honourable Prime Minister. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, sir, I thank uh, Honourable Vian Pile for the motion. Honourable Speaker, the Fijian government has uh, outlined in its five-year and 20-year National Development Plan, key development priorities which include the protection and promotion of unique Fijian culture, uh, cultural heritage for sustainable development. The Tokyo Trust Fund Board plays, uh, uh, the TTFB plays a pivotal role in ensuring the advancement of the Itoke and the Tumans by promoting initiatives that will uh, uh, initiate the standard of living and enhance uh, prior, uh, appropriate cultural traditions and values. As uh, alluded to in the TTFB annual report 2017 has been a good year for TTFB in terms of the fulfillment of its legislated uh, objectives, particularly the various projects on language, culture and heritage developed in that year. Some of these programs, Mr. Speaker, uh, are worth noting, such as the research on uh, somati or traditional funeral practices, focusing on the impact of these practices on the cultural, uh, economic, and religious well-being of indigenous Fijians. And other practices have uh, uh, been translated into Wasawakawiti and uh, submitted to the Tokyo FS board for dissemination and awareness. The curriculum on traditional leadership uh, and governance, uh, titled So Wakini Wanua, has been approved and uh, registered by the Fiji Higher Education Commission as a certificate three level course. The 14 week course, uh, Mr. Speaker, is written and taught in the Itoke language. The offering of the course at the Center for Appropriate Technology and Development at Nandave uh, started in November. Uh, as the course targets the successes of traditional leaders, uh, the first class of 23 consisted of successes from the Telebu and Rewa provinces. Cohorts of uh, students made up of school teachers and another of the Ministry of Tokyo Affairs staff undertaking the diploma in vernacular studies uh, continued with a total of six courses. In collaboration with the Tokyo Institute of Language and Culture, uh, Honorable Speaker, two new comics of uh, Fijian folk tales, Ndabula uh, Kata and O Dimai Langi, <coughs> excuse me, are being illustrated as comic print productions illustrate that Tulebuka Lendua was retained for the work. 
in collaboration with the Tokyo Institute of Language and Culture, two new comics, uh, sorry, uh, three new short uh, bilingual books for children have been published. Uh, La Sasanga is written in Rotuma in English, while Kusima enjoying fish and Kakanandina in the market root crops at the market are re written in Tokyo and English. The books, uh, on the speaker, will be launched <coughs> and sold. They are a result of the Information Text Awareness Project run in collaboration with the International Development in Oceanic Committee of the International Literacy Association. Consultant Mr. Fergus Clooney continues the researching of the ring ditch uh, fortification at the Waindamundamu Heritage Site located in Lodala Beach Estate. The final report is ex uh, expected to be um, available and will include guidelines and recommendations for the formation of a heritage exhibition site. In uh, partnership with the uh, uh, Sainsbury Research Unit at the University of East uh, Anglia in the UK, two members of the staff were part of the Fijian Heritage uh, Team, invited by the SRU to the UK for a two-week study visited on international awareness on museology practices. On their return, Mr. Speaker, the staff collaborated with other Fijian Museum team members to create an exhibition titled Kamunanga, a, st a study of Tambua. The exhibition was launched by His Excellency the President of Fiji on 15 June. Due to its uh, relevance to the wider uh, Fijian community, it has since been opened to the public. Also in partnership with SIDU, a field workers network was established the network would be an important part of the research that will inform exhibitions at the planned uh, cultural center on the intangible cultural heritage of the uniqueness of each Vanua uh, in Fiji. An active citizen's approach to the training of uh, field workers representing the nine Tikinas was conducted uh, for the group of uh, field workers who represented the nine districts of the Vanua of Rewa. A Canon DSLR camera, camera with accessories was brought to assist in the documentation of field data. Uh, funding for uh, projects held in partnership with SRU is the grant of uh, $20,521 from the UK Art and uh, Humanities Research Council through the SRU. TTFB, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker became the implementing uh, partner in Fiji for the British Council Active Citizens Program. AC is the uh, British Council Global Social Leadership Training Program that builds skills in uh, intercultural awareness, problem solving, and mentored uh, community engagement. At the core of uh, Active Citizens is a methodology that uh, combines empowerment uh, in connectivity and global awareness with community development through social action uh, projects. In terms of investment, uh, Mr. Speaker, TTFB is currently working on a business enterprise framework which targets the development of resources such as forestry, land, and other resource sectors. Mr. Speaker, sir, this government has been driving development in with respect to culture and heritage, leaving no one behind as part of our Gold in the National Development Plan. I thank you. I thank the Honorable Prime Minister, Honorable Nawai uh, uh, Thank the you, floor. Honorable Speaker. What the Prime Minister was reading out then were some of the outcomes of the uh, of the. Uh, of the Tokyo Trust Fund Board. He was talking about the Kamunanga, which is a study. He was talking about Kusima, which is a short story. He was talking about Revulakata. You might remember, Honorable Speaker, you know, when we were young, Revulakata and Rauni Vilevu and Rauni Vilelai. And after all these years, I'm going to turn 60 now, this year. They've only managed to write one book on Revulakata. And I'm asking myself, what about the meaning Revulakata is in all societies? 
And that is, and that, and the Prime Minister appears to be saying, this is in line with the government's five-year plan to protect and promote unique Fijian culture. How contradictory, how ironic can you be? If the government wants, if the Prime Minister wants to be serious on that, he should go look at UNDIP, UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights. It will guide his government on what to do if he's serious about the protection and promotion of the uniqueness of Fijian culture. So that's total hogwash coming from the Prime Minister to be saying that. To be saying, at the one hand, we are, they're not even supporting it. This is an independent institution. It's not even government. And I ask, there is, I ask why, why is it coming here? TLTB does not present its annual report to the parliament for the basic reason that it is unique. It is part of the cultural autonomy of the Fijian people. They report there. They don't bring it here. So it is ironic. It is contradictory for the Prime Minister to be saying that on the one hand and to be terminating the Great Council of Chiefs on the other and to be nationalizing the provincial councils on the other. So you can't say that you are promoting and protecting the uniqueness of Fijian culture if you are saying this and on the one hand you are cutting that out. You are forbidding us talking in our mother tongue here. So, so let's be frank. Well, I agree with you. Know, there's a few other comments that I wish to say in relation to this. And uh, uh, the, the point that I wish to say is that this institution has not done enough. It has not done enough. <laughs> sure, there are these things here. And it feels like the Fijian culture is a dead culture. Fijian culture is not a dead culture. We are living our culture. We don't need researchers like this. We need to teach our people to live it. How do we do that? You introduce this into the education curriculum. So they know it. We don't want it written so that you can come back and read it. Like it's not academy. We are living it. And the, 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 the fear for us is that very soon, if we do not do enough, we will lose it. We will lose our language. We will lose all the idioms and the stories of the Mekke. So I asked, well, asked the Fijian Trust Fund, have they taken account of all the history of all our tradition for the main fact that it is oral tradition. If you don't write it down, if you don't go to each village and write down all the mechas in this village and all the idioms and all the old stories in this village and all the songs and all the dances, you will lose it. That's why I'm saying the, the, the Fijian Trust Fund is not doing enough. You need not do research. First, take a stock take. If they care to go to the intellectual properties, conferences, overseas, they would advise them, first and foremost, take stock. Because oral tradition is oral. If you don't write it down, if you don't record it, it will be lost. And that is the fear that we have. And this is not addressing it. It's not addressing it. It's not doing enough. If you look at, if you look at the mandated objectives of this, uh, of the trust fund, it, it says this. There are, there are four. To provide funding for the undertaking promotion and sponsoring of programs of the language. No. If we are how can, but here in the parliament, we are forbidding us to say it. So how can you be serious in relation to that? You don't promote Tokyo language if you forbid us here to speak my mother tongue. And then it goes on to provide funding to help the management and leadership and to sponsor research languages are the culture of the Tokyo and the Tumans. So I'm saying that this institution is not doing enough. I have asked time and time again, who will go out to the village communities to write down their songs, to write down their dances. Is it the responsibility of ITLTB? No. Is it the responsibility of the Itaukei Affairs Board? No. Yeah. But here we have, here. It's their responsibility, but they're not doing it. Uh. Where is the archives of all the stories? Where is the archives of all the mechas? Where is the archives of all this? 
There is nothing in the ministry. Order, order. Honorable Minister, you go to the ministry. There is nothing there. Order. There is nothing in the ministry. There is no record there. Order. We have we hear it all and over again. Bremula kata entumbuna rani vile mu rani vile lai. Only two. But you go to the villages. They have their own bremula kata. They have their own stories. They have their own meches, which by now they are gone. So that is the serious point that I wish to say here, honourable sir. You are not doing enough. The other point that I wish to raise is the actions by this government to interfere with. The, the purpose of this uh, honored body, the trust fund. If you look at uh, this trust, the trust fund was uh, established in 2004, and very clearly, the act that established it said, no, I really love it. I have 20 minutes. <coughs> the purpose to establish a trust fund for Fijian Sutuman to provide financial autonomy to the Mosile Turanga to an income for the purposes of the fund and related matters. That is the purpose, to provide for the cultural autonomy. And here you have a government that passed a law to take that away, to cut out the Mosile Turanga, the Casa de Link, and that's in total breach of indigenous rights, of their right. You know, there are two rights. First right is that you have to protect culture, and the government must do all it says. And if the government does not do that, you go read ILOC 169, you go read UNDIP. Every time it sets out, this is a right, protect culture. And it sets out second to that, the government will do its best endeavors to do that. And here, it doesn't, it doesn't done that. First. It terminated the Great Council of the Chiefs, and then it terminated its source of income from here. And the breach that I'm saying here is that if they care to read the rights, you have to get the prior informed consent of the indigenous people before you change any legislation. This was not done in that way. Indigenous people were not consulted. Indigenous people did not consent to the nationalization of this institution. Now, by nationalization, I mean government now decides who sits in those boards. It has taken away our right to self-determination to decide for ourselves. And that is a breach of unity, which is our human rights, and the group rights of uh, indigenous people. I know they don't agree with that, but you know, it's common sense. If something belongs to us, you don't just change it by a law, you ask for permission. And did they do it here? They did not do it here. They have nationalized it. They have taken total control of it. And that is in breach of our right to, to give our friar an informed consent before they pass this legislation. And, and I'm saying, shame on them for doing that. And the other point of concern, Honorable Speaker, that I wish to say here, and I wish also to, to, to say, you know, public would be listening, is that the, uh, the selfishness of how they did this. You know, before, in the Ngarase government, when legislation was declared null and void, they had to be passed through the next parliament to legalize it. Here, no. They had a provision in the constitution that says all these decrees that were designed to terminate the rights of indigenous people in this country, to nationalize their interests, for example, the termination of the Great Council of Chiefs, it will not need be required to pass through a parliament like this. That is sad. And I wish for our sons to remember that, because we may not be here. And they have to correct all these anomalies. They have to correct all these lacunas in our laws. Thank you. I thank the honor. The last, last speaker on, 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 this, on this side from is the Honourable Tikun Duandua. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Um, 
I, I bring with me commendations from the back from your Maramaneta that you actually look better from the back from where we are seated. So we thank you for it. Uh, you are the exception. <laughs> Honorable. No, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want, first of all, I want to thank the committee for their report. And a lot has been said about uh, the Tokyo Trust Fund and the issues of the Tokyo in the House this morning. I thought I'll make my uh, five minutes contribution to it. And the contribution I would like to make uh, to this debate is about the issue of uh, the bill on um, traditional knowledge and cultural expression. The learned attorney general would know very well that in some of the, um, the addresses made by His Excellency the President, our current President, uh, alluded to the bill being tabled in the House during the term of when he, the term of the House that the President um, made um, uh, uh, those utterances when opening the session of Parliament. Now, Mr. Speaker, that bill is not before the House. Now, many aspirations of the Toke, particularly the recognition of knowledge, cultural expressions, uh, would be included in that bill. And one of the major benefits from it is that the Fijian of Itoke descent, if you want to, if you want to be politically correct in that sense, um, will be able to benefit economically from their rights, from their knowledge. Now, I believe some time back there was a lot of debate on the motive on the back of Fiji Airways and who it belonged to and who, and, um, you know, that, um, who actually should benefit from that knowledge uh, as it appeared then. Of course, Fiji as a nation has benefited a lot from it. Of course, that is uh, renowned for many indigenous uh, uh, communities in Fiji, from Lao and also from the Western Division, uh, dealing in this kind of motives. But I know this has been a long delayed bill. And it would be really, really good. And it would address a lot of the issues before the Itauke today, particularly in the funding, in funding and financing, a lot of those things that the Fijian communities would like to do through the, not only the protection of these intellectual properties, but for them to be able, the, the Toke community, wherever this knowledge belongs, needs to be able to use those rights, to be able to use the benefits of which for their own community, particularly now. Uh, now, the new COVID norm um, places a lot of difficulties and challenge to, our, um, to all of our communities and the Itoki for that matter in the rural. And, um, and we all take uh, our time to go to the rural and the rural communities and our villages. And you know, I live there for one. And we see the difficulties faced by our communities. Particularly now, uh, when um, the rural communities are not being able to sell their produce for the price they want in the market. Now, this is an additional source of income and protected under the law. And, and the Buku Wakabiti, and the name that they call it now, and that I think that is the, the name that the Toki uh, Affairs today calls intellectual property and uh, cultural expression, is one of those things, uh, Honorable Speaker, that the nation of Fiji has benefited as a whole. It is only right and it is only fair that for those who are the source of this intellectual property be given the benefits that is deserved of them, particularly if there are monetary benefits from it that the nation is benefiting. So, and I believe the traditional knowledge and cultural expression I would like to ask government particularly the, the Attorney General, to hasten the process to have the bill presented before the House. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the Honourable Speaker. Honourable Attorney General, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir, Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd just like to make a few comments uh, in respect of this particular uh, report by the subcommittee. I'd like to thank them for the committee, the committee sorry, for their work also. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, Honourable Noe Kula, as usual, 
uh, pugnacious manner. I uh, forgot to mention and read out the other uh, mission statements and indeed the vision statement of the uh, East OK uh, Trust Fund, which includes, of course, Mr. Speaker, said to prudently invest the TTF funds to earn superior returns while complying with the Itaukei Trust Fund Act to enhance the long-term value of the trust. As you know, Mr. Speaker, sir, the buildings around the, that heritage uh, building itself, where the office is situated, also has um, premises that are leased or, <coughs> excuse me, to government. I'd like to refer the honourable members, Mr. Speaker, sir, to the actual accounts that are presented in the, in the annual report itself. And Mr. Speaker, so if you look at the, the, the figures themselves, the investment that has been carried out by the new board, Mr. Speaker, sir, that was appointed by government obviously is paying uh, dividends. If you look at the uh, total comprehensive income, Mr. Speaker, sir, if you compare 2017 to 2016, it actually jumped from 5.6 million to 13.38 million dollars, Mr. Speaker, sir. Similarly, the total equity increased from 93, 93 million to $107 million, Mr. Speaker, sir. Now, the total dividends, and if you see the investments that are taken, uh, carried out, the, the dividends, Mr. Speaker, sir, slightly increased. Uh, if, as you can see on page uh, 37 of the report, the number of investments that are offshore, predominantly in Australia, uh, from investments such as like Woolworths and Westpac, etc. And I'd urge the honourable members to actually look at these investments and to understand that this is the predominant focus of this particular trust fund. That's why it is actually called a trust fund. And the focus is on investments. Now, Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, similarly on pages 38 and 39 of the report, it lays down in detail the asset value of the uh, entity. Honorable uh, Charlie talked about investment opportunities. Mr. Speaker, sir, the number of investment opportunities have been created by government, as the Honorable Prime Minister highlighted, through the five and 20 year development plan. A number of the initiatives that have been put out in respect of investment, in, for example, in warehousing, hotels, these all provide opportunities for the trust fund to actually invest. And they had been looking at some hotel sites in Suva. As you know, there's a shortage of room inventory in, in, in Suva in particular. So they're looking at those types of investments. Of course, with the current climate, they would be hesitant to do so. But I bring again the kind of obfuscation and the disingenuity of the Honorable Nawaikula when you simply focus on the so-called only focus of you know, cultural practices being the focus of the Itauke Trust Fund. But he, what he failed to, Mr. Speaker, sir, mention, that if you look at the budget book, if you look at the Ministry of Itauke Affairs, for example, he talked about the oral, oral traditions, oral culture being lost. There has been actually been a cultural mapping exercise that actually has been going on, and it has been highlighted in this parliament on a number of occasions where the staff from the Ministry of Itauke Affairs, particularly the Itauke Institute of Language and Culture, has been going out to each of the provinces, each of the uh, landowning youth units, looking at the, each of the cultural practices that have been taking place and they have actually been documenting it. He knows that. But he stood up there and misled Parliament. And again, in the budget, Mr. Speaker, sir, the budget announced last year, and I've got the book here with me, Cultural mapping program, quarter million dollars. Cultural mapping verification, review of the Itauke dictionary, special revitalization program, cultural awareness Itauke festival, library records. This is the only country, one of the very few countries in the world, Mr. Speaker. So, and again, this was highlighted in Parliament, where all the climate change phraseologies, the terms, have all been translated into Itauke language. It's so up to date where all those climatic change issues have been actually translated into Tokyo language. So I cannot understand what the Honourable Member is going on. Again, he's sort of gone off the track regarding the report itself, which is focused actually on the financial aspects of this trust fund, and gone off and made you know, references again to ILO, which is 69, which is again not relevant, 169. And Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to now get back to the contribution by Honourable uh, Tikunduandua. He's absolutely right that traditional knowledge and inter protection of intellectual property is very, very important. In fact, Cabinet only a few weeks ago presented uh, the, for bills to be presented to Parliament on trademarks, designs, and patents. And we have been working with WI, uh, sorry, WIPO, as it's known, no, WIPO. And Honorable Tikundu and in his term with the uh, Ministry of Justice would know this, and we had numerous discussions about this. 
about how we need to actually protect, protect traditional knowledge. It's not only about protecting designs or motifs on airlines, but it's also about actually things like herbal medicines. I mean, who's going to own the intellectual property? And we've seen throughout the world, for example, the very famous case about the neem tree, when an American country, uh, company sorry, went into India and took away the intellectual property rights uh, regarding the neem tree. Numerous other cases in Africa and various uh, other jurisdictions where that type of intellectual theft has taken place. So we are very much keen on that. In fact, we are working with WIPO, with WIPO, at this point in time. And of course, given COVID-19, they have slowed down a bit. But we are working on that. And we hope to bring, together with the, uh, we're doing things like the Madrid Protocol. And again, they'll be presented to Parliament in, in due course in respect of Fiji signing up to the Madrid Protocol and the Paris Convention, which actually allows uh, recognition of trademarks, patents, intellectual property across borders without actually physically going there. So once you become part of the Madrid system, you are through the recognized officers being able to get their registration done. And there's a, there's a mutual recognition of that recognition of the intellectual property and trademarks. So there is a lot of work being done uh, behind the scenes in that respect, and we hope to get the WIPO uh, input into it because we need to ensure that whatever bill or law subsequently be approved by this parliament is not only about pacifying those people within Fiji, but it's also about ensuring that we get actual recognition across borders. There's no point putting a law in Fiji when nobody else outside the jurisdiction actually will recognize it. So we need that recognition because generally the theft of indigenous knowledge, theft of traditional culture, theft of intellectual property emanating from traditional medicine, etc., is done by those outside the country. So we need to ensure that we are able to adhere to all those or subscribe to the various conventions outside the jurisdiction so then we can get international recognition and indeed more so protection of that intellectual property. So Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to once again with those uh, brief remarks thank the committee once again uh, for the input and I look forward to the members when we debate these matters to actually focus on the report themselves as, as opposed to meandering along. Thank you. I thank the Tony General for his contribution to the report and I now call upon the chairperson for his right of reply. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Say, Honorable Speaker, say, I do not have any further comments. Thank you. The Parliament will now vote to note the content of the report. Does any member oppose the motion? As no member opposes, the motion is agreed to unanimously. Secretary General. Motion by the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs. I now call on the Chairperson of the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs, the Honorable VJ Nath, to move his motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker Se. Mr. Speaker Se, I move that the Parliament debates the Reserve Bank of Fiji Insurance 2017 Annual Report, which was tabled on 4th April 2019. Is there a seconder? Honorable Speaker Se, I second the motion. I now invite the chairperson of the Standing Committee and economic affairs to speak on the motion. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir. The Standing Committee on Economic Affairs table its review of the 2017 annual report of Fiji Insurance Annual Report on 4th April 2019. For the year 2017, the theme was inclusive insurance as a way to focus the effort of various industry stakeholders to increase penetration into the communities for increased update on insurance. In this regard, various aspects of were explored while deliberating on the insurance report, one of which was to focus the small medium enterprises. 
Other issues that the committee discussed was the alarming rate of insurance being surrendered and lapsed due to inability to continue payment, which effectively is a direct loss of saving for people. The committee welcomed the Fijian government's initiative of bundle insurance, which initially covered sugarcane farmers and is now extended to rice farmers, dairy farmers, copra farmers, social welfare recipient, and all civil servants. For the information of the honorable member, members, the committee has tabled its RBF insurance 2018 annual report this morning. This report will, will be covering the latest development since the 27, 2017 annual report. The committee also noted the RBF has taken initiative to be more gender inclusive. This was done through collaborating disgraded data from all licensed financial institutions, including insurance companies, in order to better understand and design products and services that were suitable for the financial need of Fijian women. The committee was satisfied with the overall performance of Reserve Bank of Fiji as the, as the regulator of the insurance industry. I take this opportunity to thank the hardworking RBF governor and his team. Mr. Speaker said, with those few comments to enlighten this house as, the mover, as a member moving this motion, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the chairperson. Honorable members, the floor is now open for debate on this motion. Honorable Walker, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Honorable uh, Speaker. I'd like to contribute to the debates and the um, reports on the RBF. Insure annual report for the RBF uh, 2017 for 2017, thank you. Honorable Speaker, <clears throat> insurance, if there's anything that we can consider as vitally important in this day and age of climate change and COVID-19, I believe insurance would be very much at the top of all this. In terms of priority, insurance should, should be a subject that this House and the people of Fiji should regard as very, very important and urgent in the way we live in this country. Honorable Speaker, it is a known fact that the penetration for insurance in this country is very, very low. Uh, people don't seem to understand the importance of insurance, hence my initial statement that we need to take this very, very seriously and take leadership to motivate our people, even in ensure that everyone in this country is insured. In general insurance, Honorable Speaker, the penetration is most uh, poor. This is in buildings, structures. Over the weekend, Honorable Speaker, there was this story by a woman in Vatulele over during, during the last cyclone, Cyclone Herald, where she said that the house was sinking. She knew that the house was going to collapse so she ran with her daughter to the church to take shelter. That always fills me with horror, Honorable Speaker, when you remember some years back the case in Van Bear, where people went to shelter in a church and it collapsed on them. Honorable Speaker, <coughs> Every village in Fiji has or should have a community hall. As you know, Honorable Speaker, it was the policies of the government of SVT and SDL to help the villagers build a community hall. Unfortunately, 
this has been removed with the Fiji First government. Honorable Speaker, in the deliberations with the insurance underwriters, they indicated that most of these community halls are not insurance compliant. That people are taking shelter in structures that are not safe. And I have raised this on a number of occasions in this parliament that we must strive to encourage our villagers and help them to bring their community hall up to, um, up to standard so that they can qualify to be insured. Honorable Speaker, we must encourage the construction of community hall come uh, shelters in, in every village. We are now live in an age where climate change is a factor and cyclones are quite frequent. Already we've had two this year. Um, and not only in a Itauke village, in every settlement where you know that the structures are not that strong. I always remember a case when I was a hotelier, the wind was blowing. And one of my staff members, a young Indo-Fijian boy, came to me and said, sir, can the company vehicle take me to my home? There's only my wife and my daughter in our house. And it was a lean-to kind of house, about 30 minutes away in the VCC. And I had to make a very difficult decision. I looked at him and I knew what he was going through. But then you would have meant sending a company vehicle with a company driver and himself into an area that was, that was in danger was uh, developing. I could have lost a company vehicle, I could have lost the lives of two of my guys on the road. So I had to say, I'm sorry, I can do it. It, it was a very difficult decision. But and I asked him, do you have families nearby where they can run to? And he said, no, I don't really have that. So really, in, in every settlement, wherever you have uh, squatters, we must strive to build a community hall for them, a shelter. It is now um, a known fact that climate change is going to affect uh, the weather in ways that will that will produce more cyclones. So it is, it is very important for us, Honorable Speaker, to, to make sure that every village has a community hall, every settlement has a community hall worthy of, of being a shelter during times of emergency. Um, I, will you, most of us live in very strong homes, and every, every time it happens, Honorable Speaker, I remember, I think of our people in those settlements and in the outer islands who shelter in, in very flimsy structures. Honorable Speaker, <clears throat> insurance also relies a lot on reinsurance, meaning that a part of the premium you collect locally is sent overseas. This helps Honorable Speaker in spreading the risk for, for Fiji. And Fiji is very fortunate that Reinsurers from overseas consider Fiji um, positively at this time. But according to the underwriters, according to the, uh, to the, likes, to the likes of uh, to the brokers, they, Fiji is in danger of losing its cyclone cover internationally. And this honorable speaker is something that we should um, consider seriously. I remember in the days back 30 or 40 years ago, the hoteliers could not secure cyclone cover overseas. They just refused to, to cover Fiji for insurance because of the frequent cyclones. And the Reserve Bank had to set up a facility to enable the hotels to reinsure and enable them to, to carry their own insurance. That may have to come one day, Honorable Speaker, so we should be prepared for, prepared for it. And um, I would urge the government to, to start dialogue on this, 
together with the RBF, Honorable Speaker, and many companies in Fiji, Honorable Speaker, can take up the challenge to be, to be, to, we can, we can start, start setting up insurance companies. If you look in this report, Honorable Speaker, it talks about Sun Insurance, a local company, and very successful. They do a very good job. So there are opportunities for other companies in Fiji to st start up uh, insurance companies. I think, I believe it, um, sometime back, a group of uh, ETOK decided, wanted to set up an insurance company, but they, they could not get the help that, that they required. Honorable Speaker, insurance is a must thing, and especially in today's, uh, in today's uh, conditions. Uh, I was quite touched by the uh, maiden speech today by Honorable Choir, that this is a generation of COVID-19. Lots of things you have to do differently. You now the challenge is there that we have to rise up to the challenge. And one of it, Honorable Speaker, is to relook at the insurance issue. In the report that was tabled this morning by our chair, Honorable Vijay Nath, he talked about making car insurance compulsory. We may have to come to that. We may have to make insurance compulsory in car insurance, in life insurance, and general insurance. We can no longer say that it's all private driven, it's all demand and supply driven. No, I think the time has come. Time has come, now the climate change and COVID-19, that the leadership comes from, from us to say it must be compulsory for everyone. Honorable Speaker, that is my contribution on this, and I, again, uh, underline the, the message that insurance is so critical to us, and we must, as leaders, embrace it totally so that everyone is protected from all eventualities. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honourable Speaker for Honourable Fires Koya, you have the floor. <clears throat> thank you, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, <clears throat> I, um, I rise to contribute to the review report of the Standing Committee on Economic Affairs on the Reserve Bank of Fiji Insurance 2017 Annual Report. Honourable Speaker, sir, it's actually quite uh, interesting to note that for the year 2017, the theme was inclusive insurance as a way to focus the efforts of various industry stakeholders. And I think it's quite applicable uh, in terms of the setting that we're actually in now. Honorable speakers, I acknowledge the recommendations and I thank the committee uh, uh, and for reviewing the report. And it's actually pleasing to note that uh, the Fijian insurance industry, the total asset was about 1.7 billion in 2017 which has been an, uh, an increase of about 5.8% uh, from 2016, and that's quite impressive, sir. However, honorable speaker, it's also quite evident that the insurance industry needs to bridge uh, the, ins the insurance protection gap. In somewhat uh, similar sentiments just being echoed by Honorable Gaboka with a focus, and I think the focus here needs to be offering innovative insurance solutions uh, by the private sector to the micro and small medium enterprises, which forms a major part of our economy. Mr. Speaker, sir, I'd like to applaud the RBF also uh, and the insurance agencies in their, effort, in their efforts to, uh, in developing insurance policies, policies to include products for MSMEs and, and the informal mm -hmm. sector. It's actually much needed uh, in these days, um, Mr. Speaker, purely also because of the unpredictability of the events nowadays, you know, such as cyclones, uh, you know, climate change has led to this, and global out outbreaks, as we are experiencing now. Um, I want to speak. I also note the importance of um, tailor-made insurance policies that specifically target MSMEs, namely to provide financial support for uninsurable uh, risks and contribute towards MSME resilience. Mr. Speaker, so the recommendation one uh, states that proper research is required to ensure such policies would benefit all SMEs in, in various sectors. And uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the ministry, sir, um, it's in the process of establishing an MSME database to ensure that the availability of reliable data that will assist in formulating these particular insurance policies. Mr. Speaker, so with regards to recommendation four, uh, I'd like to commend the discussion on the establishing of 
of working groups, um, such as the Agriculture Insurance National Working Group, uh, for discussion with respect to products in the agriculture uh, sector. And this initiative would be a game changer to the agriculture sector, uh, because it will really entice our youth um, to harness their entrepreneurial skills in agribusiness business and, and would attract more investments to agriculture. Honourable Speaker, so whilst the Fijian government has uh, initiated a bundle insurance for sugarcane farmers, and dairy farmers, and copra farmers, mm -hmm. and rice farmers, this is probably a good time to urge the private sector, Honourable Speaker, to seriously remodel their business and, and offer insurance products in the natural resources space. To conclude, uh, Honourable Speaker, um, we are definitely, as I had said earlier this morning, so we're really in revolu revolutionary times uh, when, when the whole world is rethinking and remodeling and reposition, uh, repositioning itself, you know, we have to do that as a nation. And the insurance industry can actually play a crucial role um, in, and a critical role in rebooting the economy. And if they had uh, tailor-made products for, these, for, for the actual pandemic that we are facing, and for instance, and a great example is our cooperatives based in our rural areas. Uh, and they can play an essential role in linking these members to uh, insurance products such as life insurance, medical insurance, etc., uh, and, and also superannuation funds. Uh, Honourable Speaker, sir, I thank you for giving me the floor to contribute to the motion. I thank the Honourable Minister. I now give the floor to the Honourable Dr. Philip Tishawau. You have the floor. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, sir, I rise to contribute to the debate on the uh, 2017 uh, RBF insurance report. It's uh, critical that we, when discussing insurance, also share the uh, sentiments uh, from the experts, especially uh, when we did our work as the committee, and uh, which might not be too detailed in what you have in front of you. As uh, raised by Honorable uh, Minister, the um, SMEs, insurance is a critical area. That's also uh, raised by the various uh, stakeholders. In particular, the small businesses. Uh, we have uh, received, uh, not only in the constituencies, but also as members, uh, concerns regarding uh, insurance for small SMEs in the tourism sector. Particularly those who are informal, maybe not, don't have land titles, etc. Um, based on Matangali land, who uh, do not comply, so it sort of requires a relook by the uh, insurance providers at the, uh, with the co compliance requirements in order to include these, uh, these small uh, SMEs. Another area which was, uh, where concern was expressed was the delay in the um, review of the Insurance Act. And, uh, the Insurance Act uh, 98 has been uh, identified as, uh, review has been identified as long overdue, and that is an area which uh, not only the providers but also the regulators have identified as, uh, as critical. It has now been placed for nearly 20 years, and it needs uh, a review in terms of the provisions, and we are um, urging the government to facilitate uh, of that. Uh, we have also um, received feedback on agriculture, introducing insurance products for agriculture, as mentioned by the Minister, and we note uh, the Agriculture Insurance National Working Group has been established and uh, discussing, designing and implementing an action plan for the provision of agriculture insurance, and they first met in December 2018. Again, that is something in progress which needs to be facilitated, facilitated and uh, driven to a conclusion to benefit the uh, agriculture sector. The other information I just wanted to share with the House was uh, from the um, regulators, that uh, government has become a member of the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative, which is um, very, very useful for the Pacific, meaning Pacific uh, Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company can now offer sovereign paramedic insurance, so covering 
insurance, uh, insurance covering specific events rather than uh, a general cover, such as cyclones and uh, tsunamis. Eh? So that is um, a good development, but again, which needs to be um, progressed. Uh, we also uh, note from uh, RBF the Pacific Inclusion Financial Inclusion Program, who are working on a Pacific Regional Climate Risk Adaptation and Insurance pro Project, which is a parametric index micro insurance for households, uh, specifically targeting households and their specific insurance needs. So uh, I suppose. The idea there is to ensure that insurance is also spread out across all sectors of the community, irrespective of uh, income or the compliance uh, requirements that need to be in place. Again, that is an area which uh, needs to be uh, pro progressed. Uh, Honorable Ngabok and uh, Honorable Minister have mentioned uh, bundle insurance that was uh, in association with the Fiji government, launched by Fiji Insurance in. Uh, Fiji Care Insurance Limited in June 2017, initially for sugarcane farmers, and uh, it includes term life, funeral expenses, fire, personal accident, which is a very positive uh, development. And uh, in 2018, it was extended to rice, copra, dairy, social welfare recipients, and civil servants. Uh, we think, we suggest that it be de de uh, expanded to other, um, I suppose, producers such as Yangon and root crop farmers. And uh, we have already suggested that. And again, uh, I'm highlighting that to the government if that could be uh, progressed. Uh, I've mentioned uh, catastrophic risk assessment. And um, from the, one of the presentations uh, we received, there was quite an interesting one from uh, an insurance, a medical insurance provider, and uh, some of the sentiments they mention, the difficulties they face in terms of uh, providing that kind of cover in uh, Fiji, in terms of um, the equipment needed, the investments they need to make. Eh? And um, one of the issues they mention is because of the um, high risk and high investment, is the need to partner with government. And uh, government had made uh, an announcement on that, and uh, we had uh, sort of uh, viewed that as a positive development with uh, ESPEN regarding the uh, Mbai and Lotok Hospital. So I was wondering uh, where it is uh, today uh, regarding uh, that development and how that has uh, progressed. Maybe the Honorable uh, Minister of Economy would update us uh, later in the city. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I thank the Honourable, I give the floor to the Honourable Bimin Prasad, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I know you had difficulty identifying me at the back, but thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am going to make a very brief uh, contribution on this report. I want to thank the committee for uh, a very good set of recommendations, and uh, in particular, I would like to pick on recommendation eight because this is an important recommendation and one that is going to deal with the effect uh, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and the effect it is going to have on, on people uh, and the ability to actually keep up their premium. Uh, payment on time. I know there are many people uh, who hold insurance policies, Mr. Speaker, who are having a lot of difficulty, and I know insurance companies are providing ways and means for them to keep their uh, policy uh, alive. But there are also many who are giving up, and uh, as the committee um, rightly notes, you know, this is even before the onslaught of COVID-19, uh, that the, the alarming rate of insurance being left due to inability to continue payment uh, would, would be made worse. So I, I think, uh, what I would say to the government is to uh, look at uh, this issue uh, right now because we expect uh, the economy to uh, move towards a very, very serious decline for the next uh, two or three years, and we need to look at this group. And there are many um, 
insurance um, policies or insurance industry, Mr. Speaker, is very important to our economy, but it also has a lot of intricacies. There are a lot of issues within the insurance industry with respect to how the policies are marketed, how people uh, get into buying policies and then realizing the benefits and the difficulty that they have in keeping up the, uh, the, the um, uh, policy uh, premiums. Uh, I also note that the committee has talked about the RBF, uh, so, sorry, the Insurance um, uh, Act uh, 1998. Uh, this is an important uh, undertaking by the committee, and I hope that uh, perhaps uh, very soon, you know, maybe this is an opportune moment for us to actually look at the uh, Act uh, and, and look at what might be the situation in the next three or four, four years and in the future to deal with some of the issues uh, that might arise uh, out of the insurance industry. Uh, I think the public consultations uh, that um, is being planned, uh, or I'm not sure whether it's already been done, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I think we need to carefully look at what are the concerns of the people, because I know that there are uh, medical insurance policies where a lot of people have difficulty where a lot of people find uh, that the product which they bought or they, they took the policy on uh, is not delivering uh, to the extent or the, to the expectation of the people who bought policies. And, and I think we need to look at some of those issues while we are reviewing the Act so that this can uh, be brought together uh, as part of the uh, new Insurance uh, Industry Act in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right, thank you. Honourable Member, Honourable Minister Suri Ratu, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, sir. Uh, I'd like to contribute to the, the motion before the House, but uh, I think enough has been uh, mentioned about uh, insurance uh, uh, policies. Uh, but I, I just like to uh, make a quick comment, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, on uh, the issues about community halls. Uh, I need to clarify this. Uh, government did not totally remove uh, the assistance uh, of, uh, given to our communities on, uh, on uh, community halls. But uh, government decided to uh, uh, relook at the priorities in terms of um, the implementation of such projects and, of course, ensure that it's consistent as well with uh, uh, the current acts that we have. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, one, uh, let me, uh, as Minister responsible for disaster management and rural development, also uh, make this point very clear. There is a difference between community halls and evacuation centers. And government is very careful about this because I know, I know for a fact, Mr. Speaker, sir, that our community halls are also referred to as evacuation centers. But this is why government decided to review this, because when people like the, the Van Der incident, sir, they uh, ran to the church uh, as, uh, uh, for shelter. But then the church collapsed. It's a question about standards. Because in the Disaster Management Act of 1998, which is currently under review, there are what we call designated evacuation centers. And when uh, such facilities are referred to as designated evacuation centers. Government has a responsibility to make sure that these facilities are built to standard. And unfortunately, I say that again, Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, most of our or some of our community halls, which were referred to as evacuation centers, were not built to standard. And there is, we have a responsibility to look after our people. Uh, their safety and well-being is our priority. And we have to ensure that whether it be evacuation centers or community halls, it must be built to standard if they are to be used for shelter when the need does arise, Mr. Speaker. And that is why the government decided to review this project. We, Mr. Speaker, sir, through the DRR uh, allocation in 2013, secured the first $2 million in which the focus was on community halls, sea walls, uh, river protection, river bank protection, and I believe that allocation is now uh, resting with the Ministry of Waterways. 
That was the first allocation of DRR in which we continue to provide evacuation centers to the people. Mr. Speaker, sir, government and now government has come up with a new design for what we call these purpose-built evacuation centers, and they can be referred to as community halls as well. It was not totally removed, but of course we have to review this in terms of our priorities, Mr. Speaker, sir. Again. Again, let me say this. We must build to standard. Of course, we need to review some laws that we have. One is the building code. Mr. Speaker, sir, the building code, unfortunately, does not cover most of rural Fiji. And this, when it comes to standard in rural Fiji, is the rural local authority. We had, we had these issues in previous uh, governments, Mr. Speaker, sir, and we have continued to raise it from DRR perspective. That needs to be looked at in tandem because, unfortunately, our building code is not enforced in rural Fiji. We only have the Public Health Act. Order. Listen, you might learn something. Order. You have the Public Health Act and you have the... Order. Order. <laughs> Order. So this needs to be reviewed, Mr. Speaker, sir. <laughs> I've highlighted what Order. you need to hear. Order. <laughs> last, last speaker for, for this debate, the Honourable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Just to uh, bring it back to the uh, insurance itself, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, um, the Honourable uh, Tusawao uh, talked about the bundle insurance. I I'd like to highlight the fact because it's critically important for us to understand how many people are now within this particular bundle insurance scheme. We have now 200 rice farmers, 256 dairy farmers, 11,606 sugarcane farmers, 160 cane farmers, um, 35,041 civil servants, which includes people from the disciplined uh, forces also, Mr. Speaker, sir, and 72,376 social welfare recipients. Because we've also, uh, as you know, Mr. Speaker, sir, the members in this House would know that through the budgetary process, we've also been allocating premium allocations for the social welfare recipients because we don't want them to fall further into, through the cracks again. And for the first time, we, of course, have social welfare recipients now getting certain benefits. In particular, for example, there's a, there's a, there's a loss of one of the social welfare recipients. The family is able to cover various expenses. If there's a fire, if they get ill, etc., Mr. Speaker, sir. Now, it's interesting that some of the uh, organizations themselves are paying the premiums. So, for example, with the, uh, the Sugarcane Growers Council are paying the premiums for sugarcane farmers. Copra Millers of Fiji, or Coconut Millers of Fiji, as we now call, uh, is, is paid, uh, pays the premium for the copra farmers. And, of course, Fiji Rice pays for the uh, premium for the, the rice farmers, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, uh, again, uh, as has been highlighted by both sides, there needs to be efficiency within the system. And as you may, may recall, Mr. Speaker, sir, in 2017-18, we brought about a massive reform to the insurance sector. Namely, we started off through the third-party insurance scheme. As you know, third-party insurance was actually through insurance companies, private insurance companies. It was a very litigious process. People actually had to go to courts to make a claim. And it was what we call a fault system. So in other words, if the, if the little child ran onto the road because he got scared while standing in the middle of the road, on the side of the road, and the, the driver actually hit him or her, then there would be no payout because you, have to, you could prove fault. The insurance company would say that the pedestrian was at fault and therefore no insurance was paid out. We've removed the fault system now, Mr. Speaker, sir. You don't actually no need to go through insurance companies. There's actually a levy through the LTA system. It goes through the ACCF, the Accident Compensation Commission of Fiji, which we set up, Mr. Speaker, sir. And I'm happy to report, Mr. Speaker, sir, already $10 million has been paid out. $10 million has already been paid out. Not all of them are to do with car accidents. It also includes unemployment benefits also, Mr. Speaker, sir, because as you know, we've removed that now also. So small, medium enterprises, micro enterprises that actually employ people, their workers are now covered under this scheme. And again, it's a no-fault clause. So for, for example, if I'm working on a machine, and you know, if my finger gets chopped off, the employer, the insurance company can say, well, he was grog doped, he contributed to the negligence of his thumb being chopped off, and therefore we'll only pay X percentage, as opposed to the full compensation. 
again, that's gone out the window. So it's making it a lot more easier for the consumers of Fiji, in particular those at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. We've included in there also, Mr. Speaker, sir, schoolyard injuries. And we have seen one or two claims where, for example, if you have a child maybe running around with a pencil and pokes the other child's eye, and they, lost, and they lose their eye, and it's actually happened. Now they actually get compensation for that pay through the ACCF. So some, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of change in, in, in the paradigm is actually taking place regarding insurance. The bundle insurance themselves. We have to understand, Mr. Speaker, sir, that insurance companies at the end of the day, even with the insurance companies, whether it's Sun Insurance or other insurance companies, a lot of them rely on what we call the reinsurers. All reinsurers sit offshore. They're the big boys and girls with lots of money. And they're the ones who actually set the agenda. In the same way in the 90s when we had the two or three cyclones that came, that's when they changed the requirements for getting a, slight, a cyclone engineering certification. It came from offshore. And the insurance companies then would only offer you cyclone insurance cover if you met very onerous requirements of standards for you to be able to get that level of certification and then be covered for insurance purposes. This is why many homes in Fiji very low rate of insurance penetration has been highlighted, about 12% only, and generally tends to be those who are wealthy who can get their homes insured. We obviously need to change the paradigm. Uh, the Honorable Tushawa mentioned Picrafi and you know, the various other products being offered. It's, we're a very long way away from there. I have to tell you, as we've highlighted in Parliament before, that we're working with the World Bank. They came up with one insurance product. And that insurance product, because they need to assess the risk, because under, underwriters always want to know what kind of risk, maximum risk, they will be exposed to. So if we, uh, they said, we'll only, for example, provide insurance cover to registered farmers. So they know exactly how many registered farmers we have. And we actually rejected it, because you can imagine a scenario through what we call a parametric insurance, where if you say that this area has been cyclone hit, and then everybody in that area will get the cover. But they said we'll only cover those people in that area who are registered farmers. So you could have a village, you could have a registered farmer there, you could have a registered farmer there. So the others aren't registered farmers, we only would have paid out to them. It would have been completely obscured, it would have been completely unfair. So we rejected that particular product. So we're still working through these processes to be able to get the confidence built up. And we, of course, want to provide insurance cover for these, um, uh, for these people. Mr. Speaker, sir, the, the other point that I wanted to highlight is that the micro, small, and medium enterprise uh, definition, as we announced yesterday with the assistance we are providing, will in particular for small and medium enterprises provide a concessional loan for what we call working capital. And working capital includes payments for insurance premiums. So some of them who cannot pay that will be able to use some of that funding should they be eligible for that concessional uh, loan funding, will be able to pay the insurance premium. There is a big issue at the moment in the tourism sector. You have, for example, the Hilton Hotel. It's completely empty but they have to pay insurance. And I think the insurance premium, from what I understand, is about $4 million. Now, there's no revenue being generated. Where will they get the $4 million? FNPF that owns Westin, Sheraton, um, you know, Intercon, and, and the other properties, Momi, uh, GPH, etc. they have to pay the premium for them. A lot of insurance, a lot of hotel properties are facing this issue. A lot of factories, garment factories, actually, that have some have actually reduced their hours or have been shut down because of no demand from Australia and New Zealand. They still have to pay the insurance premium. So some of the insurance companies are working with them. There's, of course, going to be a new norm that's going to be set. But at this point in time, the only certainty we have is the uncertainty. We know it's going to be uncertain times ahead. Nobody within the financial sector at the moment knows how it's all going to pan out. So to be able to, to say, let's do a law now in place, or put a law in place is actually a bit premature, because we do not know what the new paradigm will be. But I'd like to thank the committee for the work, Mr. Speaker, sir. This is, of course, very challenging <coughs> times, but in respect of the bundling of insurances, et cetera, we're looking forward to that uh, you know, being furthered uh, along the track. And we'd like to, of course, thank the Reserve Bank of Fiji for the regulatory oversight. Thank you. I thank the Attorney General for his contribution to the debate, and I now give the floor to the chairperson for his right of reply. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Uh, I thank all the Honourable Members for the contribution. Just to add uh, on uh, the Honourable uh, Gabuka's comment, 
uh, very rightly picked up by Honorable Lina Sarath. Uh, we had three construction of three education centres, which I just want to mention that uh, the government had in its plan. There was uh, Koso village, Nakoro Tumbura village, Moumi village in uh, Namalata Talibu. These are the three projects which was already initiated. And this is why the government is investing a lot uh, in uh, school building, uh, Honorable Speaker say. That's why to category five, which CIU often look at these projects, so that the evacuation centers are safe uh, for the information of this uh, house. With this word, I thank all honorable members. I thank the honourable chair. Parliament will now vote to note the content of the report. Does any member oppose the motion? As no member opposes, the motion is agreed to unanimously. Honourable members, on that note, we will suspend proceedings for lunch and Parliament will resume proceedings at 2.30 p.m. We adjourn for lunch. <laughs>